Okay, Lako, you can start, Isaac. Okay, so I'm starting now. Um, I've considered uh, presenting also the preface to the second edition, but I think there is just a lot of name dropping, and we said a lot of it uh, previous uh, in the previous um, meet. So I'm just going to start with the introduction. Where one can find three, oh, why doesn't this? Okay, S kind of three basic ideas which will be important for the whole book throughout the whole book. So the problem of pathology, of course, uh, considered as a whole. So the concept of, of pathological should be uniform across particular research programs like physiology or psychology. Uh, the technique of establishing or restoring norms, namely um, the, the me medicine and its embodiments in clinic and therapeutics is not reducible to a single form of knowledge. And this thesis is not going to be a renovation history or normative judgment of medicine as such, but um, kind of um, an introduction of certain uh, medical judgments or facts into the philosophical renewal of certain methodological concepts. And there are two interesting citations here that I should probably mention. Uh, the first one is about philosophy, the second one about medicine. The second one is, of course, self-explanatory if we consider the three points I've just mentioned. Philosophy is a bit um, not so clear what he wants to say. I kind of can sense where he wants to go, but uh, I can't really explicate it that good. Perhaps we could talk about it later. Uh, so the, the, most, the question that concerns the first part uh, of the book is, is the pathological state merely a quantitative modification of the normal state? And of course, for the introduction, he gives us a brief historical sketch, kind of an introduction to the problem of, uh, so this quantitative pathology. Because as, as he quite clearly shows, uh, in the ancient world, um, there were two, two kind of approaches to studying diseases. One was ontological theory developed in Egypt, and it depended heavily on localization of external pathogens uh, that entered the body. And uh, the, the kind of, um, it was very important then to expel the external, to localize and expel the external pathogen uh, to end this disease possession. Um, and of course, throwing up worms then meant being restored to health. In contemporary medicine, modern medicine actually, for the past uh, century and a half, uh, this, this kind of localization, ontological theory was probably best um, instantiated by, by germ theory of infectious diseases. Of course, nature here is a complete negative. It's, it is nature that introduces these external pathogens into the human body. So the, the trust that patient has to have um, in the medical establishment, establishment is actually placed into, into the therapeutic technique with which one can expel the external pathogen. The second theory is the dynamic or functional theory developed in Greece. As we all know, um, uh, it, Greece were very famous for this kind of first rational medicine of four humors. Um, and it heavily emphasized the totalizing function of the uh, different forces in nature and also in the human body, which were in health in a harmony or equilibrium. And actually disease um, was a special state where this harmony and equilibrium were lost. Um, and the nature tried to regain them or, or constitute, constitute new equilibriums. So the medical procedure there then has to follow or support the natural uh, restorative powers that the body possesses. So nature is here for of course positive and the trust is placed in its dynamics. This duality is of course present throughout the whole history of medicine since it was always alternating between this, these two epistemic relations to disease. Uh, he also gives some examples but what is very important for me and this is going to be my first point for discussion is that it seems that this relationship between technique and nature is also present in his ontology of health namely that there's in the natural um, ability of organisms to constitute uh, new normativity, there seems to be some implicit technique with which they do. And this technique itself is a natural phenomenon by that. So there's kind of, he tries to, there is a, a reflective relation between history and ontology in his um, explication of health. Um, what is also interesting is that uh, this dynamic can also be applied to contemporary, uh, contemporary uh, pathologies. So if one differentiates between localizable genetic 
and functional proteomic diseases. Of course, this is more. This has to more. This has more to do with the concept of error that Hakanjem develops later. An interesting uh, example here would be cancer, since it can kind of follow the dynamics of both categories. Of course, these uh, this this um, opposition or this uh, dialogical movement is actually inscribed into a kind of uh, he says a polemical situation of we could say also proto-vitalism because there's a qualitative difference between pathological and normative phenomena, normal phenomena. But there, so there, the, the process but by which one and the other happen is completely different since disease is kind of a battle against an external pathogen or a struggle between internal forces, which then kind of evaporates once the health, once a healthy state is established. Now, a critical question here, I think, uh, is I think, um, uh, the historical way in, in which the duality of norm and pathological became kind of a, a quantitative monism, one could call it that. And there's an interesting way um, Kangiem interprets this, namely through the mitigation of pathological anatomy, systematical pathological ana um, anatomy. Since this anatomy seems to, to um, provide also uh, a sub seems to accommodate both qualitative differences and quantitative measurements. So one can start with a vitalist pathology and afterwards quantitatively, quantitatively describe the anatomical differences. So once you have this systematical uh, pathological anatomy, uh, this move happens where Harvey and Haller and a lot of other people also start to change the anatomy into physiology. And by this move also the systematized anatomical pathology seems to be developing into physiological pathology. Something, so something that was previously incomprehensible, so the unity of the, of the pathological normative seems to be intelligible because it got mediated by this, this systematic pathological anatomy. Um, so kind of through the sedimentation into pathological, pathological anatomy of the relationship between pathological and normal, um, this relation, of course, became a quantitative relation in seemingly a quantitative relation in pathological physiology. And the two main actors that, uh, that uh, Kangiem is going to investigate here are uh, the philosopher Auguste Comte. I don't really know how to uh, pronounce this name and Claude Bernard, the father of modern and contemporary medicine. Uh, uh, experimental medicine. Uh, there are some important differences we, we could stress here, uh, namely um, August is, is dealing especially with conceptual, um, conceptual investigations of this, um, of this kind of uniformity of pathological and normative. Um, his epistemology goes from pathological to the normative um, and he actually wants to obtain the laws of the normal which means that disease is actually a spontaneous experiment which introduces certain variability which would be very costly or very hard to achieve in normal experimental situations. While Claude Bernard tries to not only provide conceptual understanding but most of all a numerical interpretation of different pathological phenomena. Accordingly, his epistemology goes in the uh, opposite direction. So he starts with the laws of normal physiology and tries to construct like um, uh, framework for rational therapeutic action against a certain disease and thus understand the laws of pathological phenomena. So if we now turn to the first chapter, um, so as I already said for August, it's very important to conceptually anal analyze the Pousset, what he says, what he calls Pousset principle. Uh, namely, which says that um, normal and pathological are not differences in kind or quality, but rather in quantity, actually intensity, as we're going to see. Um, and the most important problem that this, uh, this concept of uniformity, of uh, homogeneity, introduces is that, um, solves, is that the biological experimentation is always exposed to a certain danger in that by variating organ organismic uh, phenomena, so organisms, um, it is always, there's always a chance of killing them. So what's, what's the, before we can even um, attempt to really try to produce the laws of the normal by experimenting on the normal, we have to do in what, uh, find out in what way we can experiment um, so that we don't kill the, uh, the kind of experimental situation, which is the system, which is the organism itself. 
And diseases, as already said, are then these spontaneous experiments which show us certain big variabilities, variabilities which don't really induce death. Ken Giam, of course, criticizes this conceptual principle. Um, of course, he says that there's a complete lack of examples in, in Auguste Comte, uh, Comte's explication. Um, and so we can't really know which intensities and which quantities he's talking about. He then also pre uh, presents a couple of country examples. But there's also an interesting circularity between concepts of normal and pathological. Uh, namely, uh, it seems that, of course, the epistemology goes from pathological to normative, to normal phenomena, but it seems that one has to know what normal is in, or in order to determine the pathological, the nature of the pathological situation which one is supposed to investigate. And this, this is kind of solved, but not really, by the concept of harmony. Um, but this, as Ken Giem uh, rightly notices, is more of an aesthetic artistic uh, concept, not so much a scientific one. I find here a very nice um, parallel between uh, the circularity and modern kind of understandings of life, which consider uh, formalizing life into um, dynamics of life into a kind of a con uh, attractive set or a phase space of possible variations. Uh, because during any pathological phenomena or any maladaptation, nothing radically new can arise. No new adaptation can arise. Of course, this, as we will see, is a problematic assumption. Now, because there are so many inconsistencies and dubious ideas in Comte's analysis, uh, Kangem um, tries to find some, some um, stable ground in the history of this principle. And of course, the, the first name we too should um, mentioned is the Gousset himself, who considered biological phenomena um, kind of intrinsically connected to the excitation, which was the, his, his way of, of relating the organism to the environment. And if we say that, if we start from this presupposition that the, the main quantity in organism phenomena is the excitation, um, then differences in, in intensity have um, a lot more to offer than if we started from the ancient theories of disease. But even here, there are many inconsistencies that, um, that uh, Tanguyem expresses and finds out. Maybe the most important, to men most important uh, kind of inconsistency to mention is that even Brousset himself is not really consistent in what's for example, irritation means in a certain organic phenomena. Sometimes in me, it means the same excitation means a pathological, sometimes normative uh, quality to arise. Um, so one nice example he offers is here that, uh, is, is that uh, if we provide um, a uniform uh, quantitative uh, stimuli, stim stimulus, um, to a, an organism and you progressively increase it, uh, this continuity of, of quantity can produce a discontinuity in um, quality. So it seems that these two concepts of homogeneity and heterogeneity, which we were, we were investigating, um, which they were in, investigating, uh, is not so clear cut. Namely, there's a certain kind of an implicit quality or ideal of perfection that is present. Um, so if one imagines a certain a physiological quantity that is expressed as a, for example, number line of, of rational numbers, there always has to be a mark that, that uh, marks the, the normal state. And then only in relation to this, one can speak of more and less of excess and the lack of. It's a really nice um, expression. I, I, Every time I read, I'm so impressed that marking is not measuring. A mark is not a cardinal unit. And of course, this is very clear one also. The augmentation and diminution are, of course, concepts of con that connote uh, quantity. But the alteration uh, is a concept of qualitative force. So uh, just to sum up, I would like to, to present three topics for discussion. Um, first one, of course, is his relation that I already mentioned between uh, the relation between his history of medicine and ontology of health. It seems that the techniques and uh, nature kind of um, co-constitute the organismic phenomena because it's only through the technique that we are able to kind of um, create new norms 
but this creation of new norms is already a natural natural phenomena for the uh, organism as, as he will try to establish so there is kind of a technical nature of normative normativity at least when it comes to medicine um, there's also this sedimentation of the relationship between pathological and normal into anatomy, which is similar to the Husserl's analysis of the mathematization of nature. In, a, in, sense, in the sense that um, Husserl also investigates in what way uh, pure geometrical ideal concepts could be um, severed from their qualitative origins by the mediation of writing. Um, but of course, if we in interpret this as lacking a certain fundamentalist, um, fundamentalist static intention or, or like echte meaning, uh, we should move to, towards Merleau-Ponty and interpret this, this, um, this kind of sediment, this sedimented turn, one could say, as a genesis of a new horizon, a new layer of meaning. Um, and that's pro probably an, a possibility of, of overcoming normative, normativity, which was not, not even open to discussion before. Um, as I already mentioned, this conceptual uh, circularity between pathological and normal is very interesting in relation to set theoretic interpretation of living organization. In a sense, uh, early autopoiesis and free energy principle, for that matter, both both uh, define the organi organization of, of a living being as a set of possible states um, that cannot really change through the through the development or the the process of of different structural changes. Um, so there, nothing really radically new in terms of organization can can arise. And of course, one can, of course, here invoke the manifestation of surprise in the free energy principle, which is actually a function of integral and thus implies the continuity. Um, but um, what is really interesting here that in order to produce this, this kind of uh, relation, at least the free energy principle theorists uh, have to consider, have to reduce the living being to kind of a snowflake with wings, which can um, choose situation in, in which um, homeostatic harmony will be lost. And uh, the last point, uh, which, I, which I find actually more global, um, I, I was, yeah, I was a bit surprised that um, Tanguyem didn't mention any developments in nursing, which took time at the same time as the, the conceptual shifts he was investigating. And also because it seems that medicine is not really so much concerned with what he's he's trying to to achieve here to define health in in this Goldsteinian terms this is more at least nowadays um, this is more a a, a yeah a, a field for a field of research for nursing um, since science uh, medicine is more scientific in this way not so much humanistic um, what I would like to uh, stress is that um, Florence Nightingale, the, the first nurse from the Crimean War, actually understood her role in the medical procedures, a procedure as one of educating patients in what are true and what are mis misleading pains. And thus, I would like to, to kind of um, question his, one could understand his understanding of this uh, call that he mentions, that in every objective theory of health, there is a resonance of the call of the patient who requests the care. Rather, by the in introduction of, of nursing, this request got kind of reconfigured. Feeling sick wasn't only that you feel sick and you feel abnormal, rather you are much, um, you have to differ. So there's an important aspect of preventive medicine, which tries to, to, cons to consider which pains are because we are always in pain, which pains are really uh, important, which pains are just accidental in order to develop a good treatment plan, which is not so much therapeutic as preventive. Thus, in, in, uh, nowadays, we can uh, interpret in this way the new kind of disease where one, of course, um, is... So one, one, one way of looking at it is that uh, one is sick and stays at home. And doesn't do anything because he can't. The other way of looking at it is one is afraid of getting corona and he stays at home and he's not exposed to situations in which he could exercise the normative normativity. Thus, 
perhaps there is a new way of approaching diseases, this preventive medicine, which of course places trust, trust not in um, specific dynamics or therapeutics, but in certain kind of statistical facts. So this was my presentation. Thank you for listening. Okay, uh, Isa, can you maybe switch off the, so just uh, turn off the shared screen. I think this was a really good presentation in general. I mean, nicely structured and well presented. So uh, basically this was, uh, I would say an embodiment or in action of what we were talking about when we were talking about how one should go about constructing the presentation. Um, I would, I'm not going to uh, kind of force myself on all of you with, with any questions immediately. I would just like to add something and I was a bit saddened that you actually didn't go into the introductory part because I present prepared like a nice little uh, addition <laughs> with regards to um, uh, Hans Selye, who's mentioned there. You've read that, right? Uh, so when, when, when Conguien talks about that, if, um, uh, if it were possible to rewrite the book, what would have he, he done differently? And he said that one of the things would definitely be that he would consult Merleau-Ponty's The Structure of Behavior, which I find interesting, but I'm not going to go into at this point. And he also mentions that he, that he would like to, uh, that he would probably consult uh, the work of Hans Selye. And Hans Selye is basically the guy who introduced the notion of stress. So he's the beginner of the stress research. And there's this book. He wrote some books that are more accessible to the lay public. And I read this one last year. This is the reason why I'm telling you this. <laughs> It's called The Stress of Life. And what I find, find, found interesting here, and this, this I, I feel might be of interest also to all of those who have listened through the, the whole uh, Goldstein series, and particularly those who have, in addition to Goldstein, also listened to Merleau-Ponty series um, and are now reading Conguiem. Um, I would just like to say a little... Um, I would just like to um, uh, uh, point out a little story uh, that Celia provides in his, um, in his book about uh, how he came across uh, something that he called a syndrome of just being sick or a general, a general syndrome of sickness. And uh, the reason why I'm mentioning this because it's actually very relevant to Goldsteinian approaches to diseases or, and also to Conguiemian approaches to diseases as we will see. So he um, kind of uh, presents a story when he was still a medical student and he was attending like these lectures where they would have patients brought in and then the professor would point out certain symptoms and syndromes. And what he would realize is that many of these, um, many of these patients exhibited very, very similar symptoms. So th there would seem that, you know, the, the way that they felt uh, and the symptoms they exhibited were almost always ad identical. So I'm going to read a little quote from this particular passage in the book. I could understand that our professor had to find specific disease manifestations in order to identify the particular cause of disease in each of these patients. This I clearly, clearly realized was necessary so that suitable drugs might be prescribed. I could see this all right, but what impressed me, the novice, much more was that so few signs and symptoms were actually characteristic of any one disease. Most of the disturbances were apparently common to many, so perhaps even to all diseases. I could not understand why, ever since the dawn of medical history, physicians should have attempted to concentrate all their efforts upon the recognition of the individual, in disease, uh, uh, individual diseases and the discovery of specific remedies for them without giving any attention to the much more obvious syndrome of just being sick. And he also refers to this as a general syndrome of sickness. 
And this is basically something that has then led him to develop what he calls a general adaptation syndrome, where regardless, regardless of what harmful event happens, what noxious substance or what have you, the, the um, organism is presented with, the organism basically displays a set of events that are non-specific and generalized. And he calls this the general adaptation syndrome. And this is basically what has led him to posit the, 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 the phenomenon of stress, which is basically something that is non-specific and, uh, and evokes this type of reaction. Um, and this, this is not really important, but he basically splits up this general ad adaptation syndrome into three stages. And these are the alarm reaction, the stage of resistance, and the stage of exhaustion. Exhaustion, And the main idea be behind this um, general adaptation syndrome is basically to help the organism recover. So to help the organism recuperate from whatever it is that is ailing it. Um, and that, that's why he talks that uh, in, in, in the Hippocratic medical tradition, uh, they, when they were describing diseases, they didn't just say that disease was pathos, that is to say suffering, but that it was also ponos. So that means toil or work. So basically the, the organism is trying to kind of regain the, the, the harmony or the lost health. So it's also ponos. Um, anyway, I just wanted to add this as, as something that I thought might be of interest. And in general, I think it would be interesting to find a way to relate this Celia guy, who, by the way, is conceptually and theoretically not a particularly brilliant or, or profound thinker, <laughs> but still uh, the, the overall ideas behind his work, I think, are quite interesting and could be brought into contact with uh, both, for, exa for example, Merleau-Ponty and Goldstein and also Van Guyen. But anyway, that's neither here nor there, so we can go to um, the discussion now, if anybody has any questions. Uh, yes, I do. One thing I'm not entirely sure about is um, whether Kong Yim is um, defending a version of the dynamic theory as opposed to the ontological theory, or maybe trying to develop something that would overcome the dichotomy between the two. I actually tried to stress that um, he's trying to overcome the dichotomy mm. precisely because of this relation, at least in medicine, if you think uh, the the establishment of, establishment of new norms uh, is always possible, kind of possible only through the medical procedure, which is technical. But there is a certain inherent possibility in the human being to be technical. So one could say that the nature of the human being is technical in in in, in Kang Yem's way. So that I don't really know how to describe, but there's this. He tries to yeah to say that both ways of looking at disease, at least as I understand it are valid because they complement each other, because neither would exist without the other. For example, the, the concept of cancer is, I mean, the, the, the phenomenon of cancer is a good, a good present example of such a situation. Yeah, I see Then it's, uh, I suppose, pretty close to the way Merleau-Ponty talks about uh, empiricism and intellectualism in that sense. But it wasn't entirely clear to me from the text um, Probably because I didn't go beyond page 47, uh, at least not in any detail. And I saw that you did uh, include some stuff from uh, the following chapter. So that's great, but uh, probably part of the reason why I wasn't completely sure. Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, is anybody else uh, reading the Slovenian translation? Because I just, uh, I, I thought that uh, there are different um, notations of chapters perhaps, but, uh, or, or did you uh, present some stuff that wasn't included, Isaac? Yeah, I was jumping around. I, I took seriously what uh, Sebastian ah, okay. said to okay. kind of, yeah, do a holistic presentation. Yeah, but still in general, you followed like the general outline, you just uh, fleshed it out with some of the ideas that came later on. 
So, uh, uh, no, no, but the ch just to clear up, the, the chapter on uh, August Comte was included or not uh, in this uh, session? Yeah, it was. No, it wasn't. So, no, so just the uh, compare in Slovenian... the introduction. Yeah, I, I think that this chapter is just an introduction to the uh, Comte and Ber Bernard. And then the next chapter is a more detailed study of uh, introduction to Comte's philosophy. Yeah, I read I think we, the introduction. We, we just went slightly like... ahead of that, and that's all. But it was up to 47, and I think that 47 includes Bernard, right? No, no, uh, the, mm. wait. No, 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 In, it, it includes only Comte. So Bernard is not included. It mentions uh, both of them very briefly, but the chapter yeah. Auguste Comte and Brousseau's principle is chapter two, which starts on yeah, page yeah. 47. Uh -huh. So something, okay, I'm kind of, okay, okay, yeah, 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 now I see in the, in the text. Okay, so it was, yeah, okay. <laughs> so you, Isaac, you basically covered <laughs> the whole next chapter. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was a bit short, these like 15 minutes. I Even now it was 20. I was trying to keep it short, but still. <laughs> okay. But I guess the question I would have is which, which uh, view of uh, disease is prevalent today in, um, uh, out of these two? Like, is, is it the more uh, Hippoc Hippocratic way, like this dynamic understanding of disease, or is it the more ontological kind? What would you say? Just uh, let me inter interrupt here. I, I would say that the correct answer from the perspective of uh, Conguien would be that it's neither because the, the quantitative approach he is presenting, which is basically trying to move away from both of these approaches um, is kind of the, the norm. And the quantitative approach has this idea that disease and so that pathological or normal are basically a matter of degree, quantitative degree, and you don't really have any qualitative differences in normal pathological. So at the, I don't know, maybe Isaac will uh, have a, a, a more, a, a different take on this, but uh, in general, that was at least the ideal that was proposed by people like uh, Claude Bernard and uh, uh, Comte, and they try to kind of move the whole way of thinking into that direction. I actually find it really interesting that um, it's really obvious throughout the book that um, he is writing just before the discovery of, of the DNA structure. So just before the genetic revolution. And it's very all very biochemical. It's all about like um, different substances and the relationship. And I think that um, this, this new genetic understanding, I, al I already mentioned. So actually genetic understanding kind of re rehabilitated the, the localizing of disease because one could point at a, at a certain um, uh, wrong gene. Um, but even now in the past 10 years, if I understand right, there's a, going on a revolution in biochemistry, which is, um, not, which is, which is not investigating so much that the uh, bioinformatic structure of, of the, the nucleotide sequences, but actually the, the, the systems by which the structures which fold the proteins. So for example, chaperones and protein quality network. A, a good disease in this respect is the, the, the prions. I probably you've heard of it. It's basically a protein, a wrongly folded protein that can transmit this infection to other proteins. And it's in this sense, not really localizable because it, 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 it's like an, um, yeah, it's a disturbance of function. You cannot really point to a prion that, that has been the first one that, 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 that is the first one that has been like this from the beginning. Rather, there are always, yeah, you can understand. Or even, for example, the protein quality network is now being investigated and it's supposed to be one of the main causes for human aging, for example. So that it starts to function worse and worse. And by that, the, the expression of genetic material is worse and worse. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I've been learning like this entire for two months neuroscience, and it's from the main uh, textbooks of neuroscience, uh, w which are being taught in schools right now. And um, I find it interesting that I've noticed a certain obsession with trying to localize diseases, uh, which is, I guess, it sort of uh, belongs to this ontological trend, uh, of trying to find find kind of some kind of a specific place of origin for for a disease. And um, I, I got a feeling that this is some kind of a prevalent trend today, um, more so than this dynamic understanding, which I guess is more at home in areas like, I don't know, uh, alternative help, which is always preaching, oh, you have to think about your health dynamically, holistically, treat yourself well, psychological and everything. Whereas mainstream medicine seems to be more focused on just trying to pinpoint uh, where and what is wrong and fixing that in a very mechanic way. Um, I have to disagree a little bit. For example, the prions were first discovered in the the the, the in the, the research program about the, the psychological diseases so i think schizophrenia and alzheimer's and, and stuff like that um wasn't it jacob's kreuzfeld disease that basically started off the whole trend the the mad cow disease this is where the prion, prions okay. enter the picture yeah i think that this is where they kind of uh, were introduced into the limelight <laughs> and actually what i think is also very important in considering the relationship between these two theories is not just that one tries to localize but one tries to expel and the functional protein is not capable of being expel expelled it has to be corrected it has to the body has to learn or rather you have to introduce a certain certain technical molecular apparatus which will be which will teach the body how to fold the proteins in the right way I, I'm not sure if there are already therapeutic procedures that, that deal with prions. Um, but for example, in gene, in the gene, uh, in the localization of genes, it's important that one can expel these, right? Especially now it's going to be probably very, very um, prevalent that if you have a certain, I mean, cystic fibrosis, probably your genome might be edited quite soon. There are some problems still, but it's much easier to imagine the expelling of a gene than expelling of a prion or the dysfunctional protein. But would you say that this is the dominant view of disease today? Like I'm sure at the forefront of science these things might be changing but I like just looking at the general atmosphere intellectual air of the medical I don't know establishment or whatever uh, I, I would still say that their, their, their view of health is not all that dynamic it's not all that hypocritic it's not very it's, it doesn't emphasize this um, homeostatic, um, not exactly homeostatic, but like th this dynamic view of health to such a degree. But, but still, I think that kind of the, the debate that we're having now, it's a bit of a, I'm not really sure that this is a proper debate. And let me explain why. Because the, the, both of the two, two views that are presented, so both the ontological and the dynamic, are in opposition with the modern scientific view. The modern scientific view is strictly quantitative. So even if you have like an intrusion or some anomaly, it is something that causes quantitative difference and doesn't really, shouldn't really have any qualitative moment. So maybe one way of thinking about it, Primoz, with regards to what you're saying is that there are certain conceptions of disease that kind of take the ontological background, but then try to fuse it with this quanti quantifying approach or tendency. Because according to Conguiem, at least, this is the main point that has happened with modern conceptions of disease. So modern conceptions of disease, according to Conguiem, are actually a move away from these two possibilities. They still somehow are present, but the main point is that you basically have, think of it this way, like you have a machine and the only thing that, that happens is that this machine stops functioning because certain parameters have gone either too far in one direction or the other direction. So that's the only thing. So you have a, you have a normal state, uh, which is defined as a statistic statistically average state 
and disease is ba basically anomaly in one of the directions. This is the, the path that, that, that Conguiem will pursue and he will claim that, that these two um, thinkers that he will be presenting are kind of putting forward this new conception of disease, which doesn't really have, um, it is, is neither the ontological conception nor the functional or, or the dynamic conception. So uh, contemporary disease would probably have like a general story of having a pathogen or something like that. But what the pathogen would probably do is just pathogen would in a mechanical way cause an over excitation in the organism or something like that. And over excitation is, is basically something that diverges from the statistical average and the statistical average is what defines health. And Conguiem will try to show that this is not the case, that you, you basically cannot do that. So um, the, the, the ideal is neither of the two, at least in the strictly uh, historical understanding of these concepts, where you have the qualitative differences of, of pathological and, and normal. I think one could understand this relation in these it's not the most fruitful interpretation, but in naive Husserlian theory, that the, the theory, so the ontological and dynamic theories are the basic structures by which we establish an epistemic connection, this natural epistemic connection to a disease or something uh, that disturbs our health. And then this can be scientifically investigated afterwards. But the common core of what is, what is health and what is disease, this kind of um, non-objective relationship to, to, to disturbances is, is, one could say, inscribed into this opposition that either you see it like a, as a functional disturbance, not scientifically, but, but um, emotionally, existentially, or, or a localizable disease that can be expelled. Isaac, can we go into the technology bit? Sure. <laughs> okay, so uh, because uh, uh, so one of the things that you mentioned is uh, I would just like to throw out an idea and let me know what you think about this. So you said that with human beings, um, okay, one, one of the things that you didn't mention, but it's crucial, is that basically Conguiem will, and this has already seen somewhat from what we've been reading so far, he will basically try to argue for the fact that life is normative. So that life is normative and that you have take, to take into account this normativity and that you cannot just ignore it or throw it out and you, 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 you cannot... Uh, um, um, you cannot basically construct uh, a strictly statistical or strictly mechanical medicine in a nutshell, okay? So, uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, Isaac was saying that in human beings, um, technology, so technique, is what allows human beings to modify, to reestablish or modify certain normativity that's been lost or that's been challenged or thwarted or what have you, okay? Now, he, and then you said that, you know, normativity is somehow related to human organic beings. So it's, it's, they're kind of interwoven, like, right? and you didn't really go into that and you didn't, he, here's a thought. So in other human, in, in other life forms, what happens is that you, you, you have a certain species and this species has to produce a whole variety of different individuals of which only few survive. So basically you have an experiment in the sense of producing as many individuals as possible and then only few survive. So you're kind of trying to establish what will be a, a, a conducive norm by these, this overproduction of organic individuals. Another way of doing it is basically to 
to create a lot of virtual selves. So basically by tweaking your own normativity, you, you create and kill a lot of virtual selves in order for you to establish a good normativity. And this would be something that technique does. Technique would be basically a different way of producing this multitude of different experimental norms out of which many die, but you can produce them in one individual, either yourself or from somebody else. So for example, a doctor may do it for you. Uh, and this, this, this could be one way of looking at technique being something that is related to the Congruian conception of life, organic and normativity. Um, actually, I, I've been thinking a lot about this, this relationship between the technique and, and, and life, and actually health in particular, because <clears throat> as I said first, I thought it's so weird. He doesn't, and Foucault also, I think, he, doesn't, he does not mention nurses, right? He does not mention nurses. So he's always talking about the technological aspect of medicine, but he never talks about the people who really do this technological aspect, who, who embody it, right? He's always talking about the abstract objectivists who are prescribing the diagnosis. But not, never is he telling, okay, are there also dynamics that influences the very application of, of technique into an individual's life? And if I think that if we take, for example, a cure as a technology of establishing a norm of a cure for cystic fibrosis, which then establishes a new kind of way of being with this extended uh, kind of normativity with, uh, with, the, um, with the cure that enables a person to live longer. Um, what I would like to stress here that the technological aspects for me is something very it's not passive and it's not active in the sense you don't really know what you do completely but you it's not completely given to you it's somewhere in between or neither and i was actually thinking along those lines that with the technology and understanding of technology a certain horizon appears and then you can think, okay, so I can improve this, 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 my, my normativity in such and such a way. But this horizon is not, um, it's kind of, it, it does have a sense and it does have a meaning, but it's not, it's not, so it's neither intellectual nor mechanic. So we don't really have a, an, you don't really have truth here. It's just the production of normativity. Easy, that, but yeah. that, that's the reason why, why I gave this analogy because for example when you have like this proliferation of different individuals many of which die off it's also basically a certain way of tinker toying so you know it's it's neither completely mechanical and at the same time like the, there is a certain shift or you know already being a certain species already is given within a spe specific um horizon as you would put it so it's not not completely random so there is like a, a, a some sort of a field within which this happens but it's basically tinker toying it's the same as with technology let me give you another uh, uh, example we were talking about this crypto stuff and blockchain and you know now that i've been looking at some of the people who are actively involved in this the way they develop their things is something precisely um, it, it's on, it, it's very close to what you were describing. So they, they have a vague sense of what they want to do. And they, they basically start tinker toying and they don't really know where this is going or what's happening. And all of a sudden, you know, after a couple of months or a year, there's a new product so, of some sorts and it's vaguely resemblant to what they wanted to do, but it, may even go in a completely different direction and the way this is this comes about is precisely the way you described it it's not like they have this overarching plan as to what they want to do but it's also not completely random so they're not just like you know going at it they're they're working within a certain field and as they're doing it they're modifying this they're modifying the possibilities that are opening up um so 
yeah, if we return to the to the error example of, of producing many individuals, only of a few of whom survive. Um, as regards to the protein quality network, I've been reading an article. I don't know how, how trustworthy it is, but it actually established that chaperones, so the protein quality network, the, the, the things that fold the proteins, are in a sense the first check of the of the genetic um, lottery. So um, that the gene gene pool can variate a lot, but the chaperones are going to um, kind of fold the proteins in the same way as they did before despite having a different amino acid, acid sequence. So what I'm actually worried or what my, my not an objection, just a, a thought is that um, if, if in a sense, this, this population that you're describing, it's completely passive. It's at least as I understood it, it's, it's a mutation that just happens. But I think it's much more. There is something uh, that this mutation itself is controlled, but not in an active way. So that actually, if I talk about the horizon, um, that's why I love Derrida. But that's another story. <laughs> but how to think yeah, that? Yeah, uh, another story. <laughs> how to think that uh, the horizon, not just in negatives, it's not passive, it's not active, but rather to to establish a positive account of what it means to but I, I don't know how to do that it's maybe through the I, I was thinking when it comes to health I think this might be um, by the mediation of another person so that actually our parents uh, nurses teach us how to act in the normative uh, dimension so provide a certain practical theory which is always and not completely aligned with the technological aspect and by way, you're you're not really doing errors. You're following the kind of implicit presuppositions in in establishing a norm. But this normativity itself, the the uh, the technique by which you try to establish is changing by when you work in it. In the same way as when you introduce a whole lot of individuals into a population, is not just that you introduce certain virtual selves no because they're really uh factual you also change the environment at the same time so it's not just an error like there's some yeah yeah, yeah. non-active regulation happening i don't know how to describe it differently but yeah certainly okay, that's, an important that's a good point but i think we've kind of went too far in one direction so <laughs> maybe we can go back if somebody would like to take this somewhere else <laughs> something that's cool uh, yeah sure uh, go on uh, okay, thanks. Uh, I guess I, a bit of a digression, but it relates to this. I, I mean, what what would you say that his um, like understanding of of norm normativity is or the norm? You, you you've spoken about the norm, but and maybe he talks about this in uh, later chapters. But like uh, he probably diverges from this conception that the norm is like a statistical average of, of some kinds, right? So, but um, but does did anybody get like uh, uh, an impression of what his alternative might be? So basically, um, uh, in, in the theory of disease or health, you have, um, of course, this um, objective approach. But then one important approach is also Gadamer approach, which says that health is a kind of sufficiency to um, to to perform certain certain tax, tasks which are existentially important for you. But Kangiam even goes one, and if you don't, if you can't um, perform them, execute them, then you feel sick. And Kangiam goes even further. It's not just that you have these kinds of tasks that you can fulfill or not. Rather, to be truly normative is to uh, to pick out the tasks which are which are relevant for your for your um, or even create new tasks which are relevant for your situation. And we're not present there before. And if you just have tasks, so you have to take medicine, you have to work out, you have to do that. That's just the Heideggerian, uh, um, uh, Gadamerian way of approaching the task. But I think Kangiem goes this step further. So it's not just I complete the task, but I transform it by completing it in a way. That would be the difference, for instance, between uh, what he calls so life. Uh, life is characterized by 
having a norm. This would be the Gadamerian part, but it's also normative in the sense that it can transcend the norms which it currently kind of embodies and can uh, set down new norms, create new norms. So he basically explicitly says this, that normativity of life means uh, the ability to uh, construct new norms, not willingly. The, he doesn't, could, could you just... Uh, uh, he doesn't sorry. Des describe them in the sense of, I know what you would like to hear, Timmy. <laughs> you would like to what? hear like something close to an explication or a definition, and he, he's not willing to give you that. Uh, no, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, just uh, complete your thought if you haven't. No, no, no. I, th I think that the, the best he can do basically is to... This is why, for example, Charles Wolf really likes Conguiem. That's what he told me last time. He doesn't really offer like a positive account. When you have someone like Merleau-Ponty in the structure of behavior, he's going to try to put forward like something. Well, maybe we, if we introduce the concept of Gestalt, the structure, maybe we can think about organism from a different perspective. Conguiem, from what I've gathered from this text, and maybe Isa can correct me here because he, he read the whole thing as well. He does not really tell you what the norm, norm is, but what he's telling you is that when you're observing life, you always kind of, for example, if you're studying life, you always are, you are, you are kind of like, uh, you are like that proverbial owl that lands or alights too late. So you always have to wait for the, for the life to institute its norms and then you study them. Okay. Uh, just to, to continue, maybe uh, what I was thinking about is like, I, I would like to get clear on the, maybe the relation between this. I mean, his conception and, and like uh, Otto Boys, I guess, and the free energy principle is like you mentioned those. So, so maybe if you have some, I mean, what I was thinking about is like, you can, you can keep, you can retain like the, the notion of a, a statistical average, but you just have to add some, some kind of a, a mechanism is maybe like, a loaded term, but something that brings it about, something that keeps it in existence, right? Something that relates to the environment, that that uh, structures those constants in their place. So, so maybe I, 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 that's the understanding I have, like of the free energy energy principle. And I was think I was wondering whether this could this relates to Kongilem's idea of normativity or or, or no. Exactly, it's precisely this. I forgot to mention the Isaac, first. Can you first just point. maybe, for people who don't know, briefly mention what autopoiesis is and free energy principle is? <laughs> very briefly, very briefly. I don't, <laughs> no, I don't know if I understand so well, but uh, basically, the idea is that you have a set of of possible states of an organism, um, out of which, if it moves out of them, so if you encounter an organism that is out of his essential states, it's gonna die, right? And you describe the essence of organism by uh, this is the the a very early autopoiesis by by counting all the all the of course I'm not really sure in what way the, the, the set this is constructed but let's say it's this extensional count extensional counting of particular possible states this is more obvious in free energy principle so that you kind of start with this so how far can uh, can uh, an organism transform and still be alive that's the the, the question here and you try to point out all and gather them in a set. And the point is that um, how the organisms do this is that they have in free energy principle, they try to, I'm not that well versed, but the way I understand it is that they try to minimize the surprise of their sens um, sensorial states that have the contact with the environment. So by, by um, considering the whole of their life, that's why they, they have this disintegral. So the whole, every decision that, that they have that they've ever made gets uh, kind of um, gathered. And then the whole, you compute the, the statistical um, convergence to kind of one of these states which we counted before. And the way our organism does this is that he always considers, tries to model the, the, the um, environment in such a way that's novel. There are not gonna be truly novel stimuli that are gonna arrive to his sensory or yeah state, for example. That's the way I understand it. And uh, I mean, this is a cybernetic idea that you have this set of states 
And as I understand, the early autopoiesis does the same. Of course, then the, this actually the important point here is the phase transition. And this relates to the uh, relationship between Gadamer and Kangiem uh, when it comes to health, right? Gadamer I just wonder this... whether Gadamer would be really, would really appreciate it if we kind of <laughs> put him in this category. <laughs> but there is some, some kind of implicit um, Hellenistic way of viewing health in Gadamer. Like uh, he writes, I think that um, the, 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 uh, the doctor is kind of an artist that has to find the right balance between different forces, which is very like for humors like. But what I would say in Kangiem is that by introduction of the technique, you can introduce certain forces that were not there in the uh, in the first equilibrium. So by introduction introduction of of technique, so uh, extended normativity, the the um, the balance itself is different than it was before. This is, for example, very obvious in, in the medication for, for um, um, psychological diseases, because it, it's really important to determine not just the, the, the effect of one or even for old people who take a lot of medicine. It's important to keep in mind that medicine itself changes the physiology of the organism. So it changes the, this, what Gadamer supposes stays the same. And this is actually the point that free energy principle makes, that the organization also autopoiesis, that organization stays the same. Of course, structures can change and everything can happen, but the organization has to stay the same. And in the recent years, there, was, there have been some developments saying that organisms are in this kind of constant change, in this sense that it's not enough for organisms to be adaptive. Um, how to say that? Um, so if you understand the organism as a Kantian whole for which every, every part works for every other part, um, and then you introduce the, the evolutionary aspect of environment. What has to happen actually is that not only are these all interconnected, but by, the, by some maladaptation, for example, you can induce a new uh, so-called desk closure, which enables the organisms to, to um, tolerate certain transformations, which, is, which, is previ which it previously couldn't do. So, kind of this attractive set set of all possible stage, states changes by this um, uh, yeah, uh, invention of the task closure. That's what, um, and Longo calls this quantum quantum function. Uh, Isaac, I have, uh, a, I have a nice quote from Ron, Ron Brady on this. It's not directly related, but it might sound interesting. This is what he says. The forms of life are not finished work, but always forms becoming. And their potent potency to be otherwise is an immediate aspect of their internal constitution. So their potency to be otherwise is an immediate aspect of their internal constitution. The becoming that belongs to this constitution is not a process that finishes when it reaches a certain goal, but a condition of existence, necessity to chain, chain this, this is a really good part necessity to change in order to remain the same. This is interesting, I think, like this um, forms of becoming and that the potency to be otherwise is an aspect of internal constitution and this ongoing dynamism to basically change the same, to, to stay the same. It's potentially interesting. And I think this is kind of the point of punctuated equilibrium of, of, of um, I forgot his name, Gould, right? That uh, by sudden transformation, you introduce a novel aspect into um, an organism's life and thus, for example, construct a new niche. So a novel way of life is possible um, and perhaps a species even is capable of surviving precisely because it was able to, or actually, of course, you could introduce error here. So it was able to error in a good way. And in a way, yeah. But this is also the same point about that uh, Conguiem makes about uh, what, uh, what constitutes a new species. So basically this idea that anomalies that err in a good way are new species. So you have variation where you have anomalies. And th this is the problem when you're trying to conceive, you know, uh, 
when you talk want to talk about for example normativity from a statistical perspective because anomaly something that uh, diverges from a certain statistical means can be can lead into a new form of life that is actually uh, uh, either better for the same organism for the same or, or actually splits off into a new mode of life completely Primoz, you wanted to say something. I think that. Oh uh, yeah, but it was uh, kind of unrelated. It was through when you said that um, all these thinkers are interested in ignore the nurses, and I thought that maybe a, there's a certain difference here that we could make between technique and technology. And I think um, if you look at um, all these philosophers like Foucault and Conquiem. They're more interested in trying to make sense, make sense of the technique, of trying to make sense of the formation of norms rather than the execution of norms and the actual techniques which are used to accomplish this. And I think the nurses are, in a sense, the execution of the norms which have been set by doctors. In a sense. So that was kind of my thought related to that. Yeah, that's why I mentioned the reconstitution of the feeding sick part. So that actually, by introduction of, of, of nursing and um, public health, for example, it was not only that the individual wanted to have a doctor, but rather the society at large, the population could be sick or could be, could be healthy. In that way that um, nowadays, it's not anymore that you are fe you're feeling sick, sick, feeling sick, and you go to a doctor for a therapeutic procedure. Rather, you, for example, in, in the case of breast cancer, a woman uh, realizes there is certain abnormality there. And because people have told her that, um, that she should get checked out, she starts to kind of um, what Kang Yem then writes in the 20 years later and really like it, that uh, the disease is more kind of a um, loss uh, in the courage of oneself, of the ability to, to overcome the disease that might, uh, might afflict him. I think this is an important kind of transformation that with the introduction of the objective and, um, and kind of statistical technique of defining norms change also the ability the, the way we relate to disease. That's very similar to what uh, Ian Hacking was talking about, I think, in the looping effects of, um, I don't know what the, the, the actual, of humankind's looping effects of humankind's is an article he wrote where he's talking about uh, various mental diseases uh, and even social categories, which sort of uh, change in their nature in the, by the, because of the very fact, because of the way we define them. The, when we create certain kind of, uh, kinds of categories to categorize people, we actually create people like that. Yeah, because you kind of, um, you introduce a certain theoretical aspect of establishing a norm which doesn't mm -hmm. need to be completely connected to the to the uh, original originary um, kind of feeling sick part of the disease, but rather it can constitute a new way of interacting with the disease, which it's itself normative and thus kind of induces uh, by the a special use of technique induces a different way of relating to the to the to the disease that is supposed to be therapeutically um, solved. You have a link. I, I've posted the link on hacking because this is precisely something that I was uh, talking about with one of the students that will be writing an MA um, under my supervision. And it's a, it's a very accessible uh, piece by Ian Hacking. Uh, it's called Making Up People. And uh, it, it is, uh, it's an interesting case. So this looping phenomenon, as you described it, Primoz, is precisely what you said. And it partly relates to what you were saying as well, Isaac. Uh, the, the concrete example he provides here is about people with multiple personality disorders, mm -hmm. where uh, in the 70s, this was something that was kind of introduced as a classificatory term. So uh, some, some sort of a diagnosis. And then what happened is that people started identifying with this and this is the way they themselves understood themselves and related 
to themselves and to other people from the perspective of this aspect of themselves. And this, this kind of looped back to the professionals who were treating them. And all of a sudden what happened is that you got the constitution of a new class of people and a new, uh, with a new illness that seemed to started proliferating as crazy. So prior to that, there were almost no people with, with, with multiple personality disorders. And then all of a sudden you had all, uh, like uh, a huge amount of people suffering from that. And not only that, the, the category itself started proliferating. So you had these specific subtypes that, that were developing and so on and so forth. And he kind of um, tries to focus uh, on these types of phenomena and tries to understand how by intervening, you in a certain sense, at least partly constitute a certain something, which then starts to live a life of its own, which feeds back into you and becomes reaffirmed. <laughs> and once you have this loop, it just kind of continues to happen. So um, is this okay. the new experimentalism guy? Yeah, oh. that's the new experimentalism. Guy. So the Canadian philosophy, philosopher of science. <laughs> it's actually something I dealt with in my first year research project where I was basically exploring uh, the Jungian MBTI personality types as a kind of humankind. And uh, what I was interested in is when people sort of discover their types, what, what, what really happens there? They do a certain test and they give a certain result and then they start reading up on the various descriptions of their personality type. The question is, were they this personality type before or are they, are they going to become this personality type because of uh, reading all about it and because of trying to act like a certain norm, uh, uh, according to a certain norm, according to what they're supposed to act like? And um, I, didn't, I never really properly statistically analyzed the, the results I got, but I, I think uh, we, we actually noticed some trends in how if you told people they were a certain type and it was not actually the, the correct type according to their test, they're, the next time they're going to test, the results are going to actually go in the direction of the type which you sort of prescribed to them. This would be very interesting to study in a more serious way, but uh, I think it's something you can see in practice, even with things like as uh, like horoscope or something, where people <laughs> kind of identify with something and just really start to shape themselves according to this category. And, and to really go back to what we're talking about here, uh, I guess disease is also to a certain extent susceptible to this mechanism. But one thing I would like to point out here, this interesting loop that you mentioned, Isaac, so with the introduction of public health care and all of that, and where you basically have people, for, for instance, in the past, you might feel sick in one way or another, and this is where you would seek help. And now, like you said, there are these other signals that are given to you that you should monitor, and you constantly monitor certain things, and then you go to the doctor because in the past, people who were feeling sick and went to be checked up, they, they noticed these signals in them and now they're kind of putting them back at you. The, one of the things is that um, one of the potential side effects or one of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the segments on the new horizon that has opened up, if I, if I translate it into your verbiage, uh, is this a phenomenon of medicalization where you basically have, you know, this question as to whether a given something is in fact a genuine phenomenon or is being kind of produced by the, the specific, specific institutionalized looping system that has become sedimented and that has started in a certain sense kind of living in its own, where, where, pe where people basically don't feel that they're ill or if they do feel that something is off, they don't really know what it is. And then you might have a certain professional telling you, well, you know, you might have ADD or, you know, maybe your gender is off. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say, you no, know, and, and this, this, this even relates to certain more physiological problems. For instance, guys uh, after a certain age, are supposed to have regular checkups for their, their prostate. 
And after a certain age, I forgot which age, let's say 60 or so, approximately 70 or 80% have anomalies in their prostate. And they are basically what would histologically be called cancerous or precancerous. But the thing is that doctors usually don't really know what to do with this, okay? So they have this sign, but the thing is that a wise doctor might not actually even do anything. And there are several, because the thing is that they don't really know how this will evolve and what will happen out of this. So they might say, one of the ways of saying about it, but this is only one way of thinking about it, is that basically the patient is going to die before the cancer becomes a problem. <laughs> so in order for them to develop the cancer, they would have to live additionally, additional 30 or 40 years, but you know they're already 80, so they're going to die before that. So the prostate will be the least of their problems, probably. But it's not really sure whether this would even happen or not. So you see, it, it's one of those things where you kind of, you have these signs, but you don't really know what they tell you. Or another example is uh, people have random checkups of their spines and they have uh, hernias, a lot of hernias, but their back shouldn't be, is perfectly okay. So basically what sometimes, this is not something that the doctors would do, but you know, basically you have an anatomical sign that is usually associated with back pain that, that you usually try to find when somebody is having a back pain and they don't really know what to do with this again. So um, this is an interesting phenomenon that kind of seems to be happening where you introduce these signs that could be telling and could be useful. But on the other hand, you might start, th the system itself might start producing signs that then constitute something that affirms people who gave off this sign that this is in fact a problem. And then you might have these loops that could be potentially problematic or kind of um, closed in on themselves. I actually uh, think an important point here is to make about nurses because in Slovenia, they're mainly really, it's so important. They are mainly- um, You're lonely, uh, huh? <laughs> very. <laughs> Um, so in Europe, actually, during the 20th century, nurses were really discriminate. Nurses were really discriminated against, right? So this didn't really develop. In the States, however, there were a lot of philosophy nursing doctorates. Like all the nurses went to philosophy departments and got a doctorate, and it really went after. Like they really developed some. I mean, they were on the forefront of the nursing revolution. But what is more important is that um, that actually and also in the, the, the nordic countries the the role uh, and, and now in, in slovenia we still we're starting to um they're starting to develop this notion of negovalna diagnosa which tries to understand or rather uh, which tries to understand or rather um to put into law in what way the medicine um the, the medical diagnosis relates to the person as a, as a, um, as an individual. So what you mentioned, there are a lot of signs that that one might not be sure about how to act. But what is important is that the nurse recognizes in what way this might hamper the life of the individual and what measures he might take, he could take in order to avoid serious complications, which are of course possible but uncertain. Um, and in what way he can uh, include these these dynamics into his everyday life. And this is not a job for the doctor. The doctor is there to diagnose. The nurse is there to talk with the patient and to kind of a de develop a no new normativity within this all the possibilities, the horizon of being ill, right? So I think that's the, the important thing. And as I, as I said, in, in Slovenia, of course, most nurses are just administrative workers, but that's that doesn't have to be like that. You have to give them Congriem to read and uh, <laughs> Merloponti. <laughs> Let's revolutionize the nursing system in Slovenia. <laughs> I mean, in Slovenia, it was particular like philosophy department didn't want to take any nurses in the PhD programs. This was really a problem. And then they wanted to develop their own faculty, and everybody was like, what do that need that for you just administrative workers 
and now there's he's still, like why do example, you know so much about the education <laughs> of my girlfriend's the mom is teaching at Zdravstvena Fakulteta. <laughs> oh, yeah, <okay. laughs> for example you know they just developed with 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 uh, Brane, um, Branko Kljun and Škodlar uh, a way of investigating or rather including the spiritual dimensions into the Negovalna Diagnosa, which is really interesting. And it's very, something very new in Slovenia. But I mean, that's the job for nurses. And we don't really get that that often. At least I didn't before I started talking to my girlfriend's mom. There's one question here. Uh, uh, do you think that basically this nursing aspect is being that, that, that seemed to have been very important that is being basically side sidestepped now that these loops are kind of going outside of the healthcare systems into say educational systems and other systems that are other institutions within the society. So basically what's happening is if you had like a doctor who was giving the diagnosis, but then you had the nurse who had this practical interaction that was in a certain sense more attuned to the horizon of the each of each uh, specific individual that was there you don't really have that now because now what you get is like you get these formalized strategies and directives and people who get them don't really have any touch with are, are not people who are in any way trained in anything that is often that is even remotely related to the medical uh technique so basically they they're just applying these specific categories and so on and so forth and do, do you think that this might be a problem then that this is becoming like hyper formalized and then just spread throughout the society where you have like this uh attempt to formally medical i mean prevent certain things basically but then i mean yeah. there are certainly problems but the way i read for example the analytic philosophy of medicine is just like beware of the holistic aspect don't forget the person and so in philosophy of medicine nothing more can be done about this and even in normal medicine at least as i talk with with um two of my cousins study study medicine one in maribor and one in ljubljana and they both complain so much about psychology and about uh, uh, there's another subject about holistic interpretations of of, of the the patient um uh, interaction which I think are trying to solve precisely these problems to really try to see which which things are formalized and which really concern individuals as their healthy or unhealthy. So I don't think sometimes also talking, um, I have a really successful physics friend and I was talking about, uh, about Husserl with him a lot. So the methodization of nature. And then you find out that actually Husserl was arguing against the, the uh, yeah, uh, philosophical bow bow which was never really present in, in science, right? It was this mathematician is nature was always something much more dynamic than Husserl portrayed, or even like Heidegger and, and Merleau-Ponty at some spots, right? So I'm always, I'm more and more reluctant to give this kind of general assessments of science, which are so, so often included in like um, philosophical interpretations of science. So science is like that. No, it depends on the scientist, on the community that is there, on his context with other thought styles and stuff like that. So um, I think it's much more heterogeneous. How does one pronounce that thing? Heterogeneous? Homogeneous? Homo yeah, homogeneous? Two, two different pronunciations and two different spellings, I believe. One is uh, homogeneous and the other is uh, homogeneous. Now, typically they're used as synonyms, even though I think homogenous um, strictly speaking should mean something that is you know homogenous as in properly mixed through um, and homogeneous would mean something that uh, comes from the same source as something else so from the the second part is the same as in genetic and the same holds for uh, heterogeneous and heterogeneous so yeah i think nowadays they're mostly synonyms you're wasting your skills on crypto, Adnan. 
I mean, I'm doing mostly proofreading and content writing there, so, uh -huh, so it works. So, yeah. <laughs> sort of close, yeah. I don't know if many of you know um, uh, Hans Jörg Reinberger, uh, historian of science from yeah. Berlin. And he is, I think he's really um, trying to move in uh, like philosophy of science in this um, pluralist direction to understand that uh, non-homogeneous non non nature of the scientific truths even like this constructivist radicalization of popper or something right. yeah but you know uh, in general what i've read from him is first of all it's not particularly interesting it's not really brilliant like he the, these historical analysis are okay but i don't really have the impression that he's like bringing a lot of value to the table so by 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 arguing for this plurality of science yeah that's interesting in and of itself L let me give you an example so when i was involved with the cox high students um and they were doing some sort of an experiment at the at the neurological clinic and i was there and you know it was like a process like a, it, it lasted for several days and several hours per day it was messy as hell you know the the, the 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 machinery didn't work the data they got was crappy they kind of the the what they expected they would get they didn't get it so they kind of the calculations and what they got was off so they kind of you know did a little bit of juggling and whatnot and this was something mind you that was intended for the paper and eventually it was written as a paper and published as a paper so now i'm asking you sure they're doing all this stuff and they know it and we know it but after a while it gets sedimented in that paper and the way it's presented it's in a certain sense normative and even if that particular paper itself is not normative it is written in a very specific way that kind of tries to justify a certain normative, normative image of what science is and what it should be. And yes, it's messy. I know, and, and for example, this is where the, the research within the science technology studies is very useful. I'm currently in touch with a PhD student from Maastricht, who she's doing her PhD precisely in STS. And like, we're constantly talking about these things. She really is in this stuff she, by the way she was very interested in this particular um uh, reading group but i told her that we will probably have it in slovene so that's the reason why she's not here but you know she she really has this uh, spin on it uh and the, the, some of the research they're doing is valuable precisely because they actually go into the laboratories and try to observe people and sometimes they overdo it with these you know like these specific analysis where they where you just go too far you know you want to you want to overdo it and then you kind of read about all these uh narratives and whatnot and it's just hyper something but there's a merit to it what i'm trying to say though still you cannot basically deny that yes there are different sciences but if you kind of pushed a scientist into a corner usually what they would defend is some version of a textbook science and this is what happens when they either have to, not, not all of them, mind you, and the, the best one usually don't do this, but a, 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 an average scientist, you might push him in the corner and this is what you'll get out of him. You'll get some textbook, uh, textbook crap, basically, that doesn't really fit with what he's doing at all, but he has this impression that all the messy stuff that he's doing is kind of under... That, that, that it's grounded on a certain something that is moving in the direction of the ideal that is presented in the textbook that he was, that, that he kind of endorses, at least implicitly, and that he's willing to defend in front of you. I mean, <clears throat> definitely, I've spoken to some, uh, it's not, I'm not so well versed in, in, in uh, so the whole of theory and history of science to be able to evaluate his his um, kind of approach but actually for me it was really illuminating because I, I realized some things that I was kind of aiming at but not still not kind of capable of conceptualizing but um, what I would like what, what my my thoughts about this problem of pushing somebody to the side to in the corner and asking him 
uh, the question is that if you do that with a normal person, he's going to give you a Humean or Cartesian answer. He's not going to give you a nuanced um, interpretation of his ph phenomenological interpretation of his experience. He's just going to like some spout out some philosophical shit, for lack of a better term. And I, I'm always kind of um, my question is, do scientists understand themselves? And I wouldn't say they really can conceptualize. And that's, the, of course, the, 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 um, the job of philosophy of science, as I understand it, right? To, to understand what scientists can't, scientists can't. But yeah, that's what. I mean, I, I just add to this discussion something which I've said multiple times during Goldstein is, should they understand themselves? Should they conceptualize? Because I feel like it's, it's, it's asking from a philosopher uh, to use empirical methods and uh, put people in the fMRI and then try to make a, like some kind of Hegelian philosophy or something based on that kind of data. And I feel like uh, sometimes people are trying to uh, push these uh, different kinds, these different approaches together and there's no real need for it. I, I don't see like there we're going to arrive at some kind of a synthesis of these two methods and then we're going to have a good view of uh, reality maybe it's better to keep them separate and that's how uh, this uh, puzzle of uh, human intellectual history is best built with but there is certainly also a kind of crisis going on in, in the psychology biotechnology uh, research programs because most of the results are not reproduced right and they are not even people don't even try to reproduce them. And that's a big problem for the scientific community and uh, it has been going on for quite a decade now, I think already. Uh, two things maybe. This is also something that Timothy brought up on several occasions, you know, sh sh should this be something? Sh or, no, no, Timot uh, the, when we were talking, sometimes you would say things like, why would, we philosoph why would philosophers be called upon to kind of reflect on what scientists are doing? So maybe if you want to chime in on that. And the second is strictly like, uh, I would agree with what Isaac said here. It's not about, it, it's, not, it's not a merely theoretical question, Primoz. It's not like, you know, here I am having a coffee and I'm a brilliant brain surgeon and do I really need to know what I'm doing, you know, or I'm just, it's not about that. It's precisely what Isaac is saying like the, the 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 whole phenomenon that we call science has become really huge and it is extremely impactful and it it is making very very strong pronouncements about very different things and these pronoun pronouncements have weight so that it's not like you know you might want to consider this. No, it's something that will be taught in schools, something that you will, you will be launched out in the papers. And if you don't really know what the heck it is you're doing, and if things start happening as the ones, as things that Isaac is saying, this becomes like of crucial importance. Like it, it's not merely, you know, should I, it's like, it's almost like an imperative of sorts. And um, it's not, merely something that philosophers are kind of uh, trying to get scientists to do or trying to convince them that this is important. Many scientists have realized that this is, in fact, something that is crucial. For example, Goldstein and Conguilhem among them, <laughs> both were ba basically, basically uh, 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 physicians. Uh, and Varela, for instance, and Maturana, so biologists, people who actually do start reflecting on things. I'm not saying that this is necessarily like the predominant stance. And of course, we don't really know how to go about doing it. But I would say that there is the, 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 the hardcore proliferation of science and the, the, this just mm, uh, explosion of results that people don't really know what they mean, what is their merit, how methodologically sound they are, what the heck is going on, where is this you know, going, just kind of opens up these qu questions on their own. and. Uh, I would say that from my experience, also from what's happening, for example, in France and the UK and Germany, people are become so scientists themselves are becoming very, very interested in these collaborations. Sometimes they're very awkward and they come across basically as completely unproductive, where they try to incorporate people from the humanities and social sciences, for example, people from the SDS to join their uh, experimental teams. And then they kind of do something together. 
and I can give you one concrete example. Um, like the, the last and the large, currently largest longitudinal study uh, on the effects of meditation on neurodegenerative diseases, especially on Alzheimer's disease, uh, that's been going on in France. And it was um, orchestrated by Lutz. You might have heard of him, Primoz. He was one of uh, Varela's students, basically. So Antoine Lutz. Uh, and this was like a huge, a huge thing, a lot of money coming in and, you know, lasting for a really long time and getting these uh, fancy ass uh, Tibetan monks who were really experienced in, in meditation to their lab and then using them. And basically they, uh, they got someone from STS to monitor the whole thing and constantly do interviews with them. So, so that that person would kind of provide an outside perspective, like an anthropological perspective uh, on, you know, what this tribe that's doing these interesting experiments <laughs> thinks that it is doing. <laughs> and they were actually, you know, they were for it. And it, it came off slightly awkward to a certain degree. But uh, um, that person that I mentioned from Maastricht was involved in this. And she's basically writing also a PhD on that. So, and... I'm just trying to say that there is also a need within the scientific community for these types of interactions and some sort of a reflection. And again, people don't really know how to do this, but there is a need or a wish, at least. Uh, there is this institute in Bordeaux, uh, headed by uh, Prado, and he is actually, um, I'm an immunolog immunologist, immunologist. Ah, Prado, and the one who wrote the book that got the award for about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lakatos award or something. Yeah, uh, like and um, he's actually employing like a couple of philosophers, which are tasked to uh, with with investigating the conceptual presuppositions of of the the scientific community. I mean, he he kind of he he's trying to overturn the the normal understanding of immunology as a science of self and not self into a, something completely different, which which he calls continuum theory. Uh, but but it's it's it has a heavily philosophical spin there. And actually, um, he's very convinced that it's empirically more tenable, viable. Mm, yeah, I mean, I'd like to add that, I guess, some of the problems, and especially like the ones that I'm interested in, like, don't really allow for this distinction, like, at least a distinction between philosophy and science, or like, between reflection, or maybe let's say epistemology and ontology, right? So, so a good example would actually be Conglem here because like you could say, okay, you are interested in, like, like when you, you pose a question of normativity or health, you could, you could say that like, and this would be like a Husserlian, uh, maybe a na naive view of, of, of a science as a kind of a, a mathematization that uh, misses a, a huge part of the phenomena would be like, like yeah, okay, let's, ju let's just, uh, define like a, a statistical average of, of the factors that constitutes uh, the phenomena of, of what we call health without asking like, how is it actually produced? Like what, what is the background? Uh, what, what is actually the, 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 the causal factor that produces these um, this, this, this averages or these uh, specific observations, right? So here uh, in, the, in a sense, like the causal explanation of the phenomena for me would be the same as, as asking a philosophical question about what, what actually is health. Like, does that make sense or uh, I think I... Yeah, I, I, it makes sense for me, definitely. And I, I, it's, uh, I think is a good case in point because this is precisely the direction that he will try to kind of take this debate in. Um, I was just thinking, do does anybody else have any questions or topics that you would like to touch upon so as not to just spin the the same wheels <laughs> or is this now the the language barrier and i'm new to the group and i'm shy barrier <laughs> even though it's a small gr group but still it's being recorded and it's in a foreign tongue No topics, no questions. I mean, I have some, but I, I don't I, like we've, we've been talking the entire time. So 
<laughs> yeah, let's just see whether anybody else would like to join in. I'm pretty sure that some of you do have questions. I know that okay, Nair, I, I maybe have a question about uh, just a, a specific quote from the, the text on the page uh, 41 when he is discussing these two uh, ancient views and then goes to discussing this uh, new modern view of the only qual um, quantitative difference. And he says, but it proved difficult to maintain the qual uh, qualitative modification separating the normal from the pathological in a conception which allows, indeed expects man to be able to compel nature and bend it to his normative desires. And I I don't understand clearly if this is just meant like a, a descriptive statement of what happened in the um, development of medicine or is he making an argument that because they try to do this, they come up with this qualitative, um, quantitative, only quantitative difference between pathological and normative, or how did you understand this? Because I wasn't this um, transition from the two um, ancient views to the modern view wasn't quite clear for me, um, or maybe wasn't. Um, argued well enough in yeah, a sense. I actually interpreted a little bit too much here, but I thought it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I think that uh, what he means here is that um, if you really want to uh, establish a good technical connection with the medicine or therapeutic connection, uh, no, no, not medicine, but um, a disease, a good um, technical connection with medical connection with disease, you have to kind of categorize it. But this categorization itself, to know which uh, therapeutic procedures are good for which which um, forms of diseases. So he speaks of disease species there. Uh, but this transformation or rather systematization does not entail um, the transition to the uh, radical homogenous conception of disease and patho uh, pathological and normative phenomena, um, normal phenomena. And but it does accommodate for a quantitative measurement of some, some anatomical features, for example, that something is longer than normal or shorter than normal. It doesn't provide any explanation of physiological processes that, the, that this uh, anomaly is produced by, but it does allow for a quantitative measurement. And I don't really buy this so much. It seems interesting. But then he says, yeah, and now you have the systematized anatomy, the mm -hmm. pathological anatomy, and then Harvey comes. And he says, no, anatomy is just a certain function. Right? We should insert an anatomy by a function. And then all of a sudden, everybody thinks, oh, but then also pathology has a certain function. Perhaps these are the same. But I don't think he would go so far as to, for example, like Husserl say, yeah, but this new conception of disease now provides the glimpse into the intellectual, uh, the ideal, uh, ideal disease as such, which Husserl actually wants to do with the development of, of, of geometry. So this uh, a priori ontology. But Kankiem kind of thinks that this transition is not completely possible. That is just kind of an image, an idea that scientists have. We will be sometimes, uh, sometime in the future, we'll be able to convert completely. But now it's just an idea because there proved to be an interesting connection between anatomy and physiology. And thus we consider the connection between pathological anatomy and pathological physiology. The way I understood it, I mean, it, it basically is strongly related to what, what Isaac was saying, but I had the feeling that this was, so two things basically, that first of all, that kind of he presupposes that the reader knows that he's referring to what happened in the scientific revolution and uh, mm -hmm. the movement that happened with people uh, like Descartes and Galilei and all that story. And this remark the way i read it what is also at least this is how i understood it i didn't know i understood it this way un until you basically asked the question but i understood it a bit of a a bit of like a jibe you know like mm -hmm. like giving a slight slap to the to this somewhat perhaps naive position from contemporary perspective so the, the, this uh, 
conglomerate of basically you knowing what he's talking about and he him presenting it in a slightly humor humorous way where he kind of wants to make it maybe you know uh, also show want wants to show a little bit of um i don't know dismissive is way too strong a word but just this like slightly ironic attitude toward yeah him. like we all know what happened so I'm in a just certain sense, but, it, it, but a, in a very subtle way, mm -hmm. like you know, uh, I've noticed this in Conguiem a lot. The way he kind of presents some of the things, where you sense a certain irony, but it's not really like he's being, he's putting something down or making fun or mm -hmm. being explicitly sarcastic, but just you know, kind of throwing in these small jibes, giving these small slaps every now and again. Uh, Maybe not even in the sense of dissing or dismissing Descartes and uh, um, Galileo and Galilei, but just, you know, touching upon this. But yeah, Isaac then kind of elaborated on, on the whole program that was underlying all of this. <laughs> but it should be mentioned, actually, that um, it's really interesting what you, what you said, that it's this jibe, because um, he says in this action, so second chapter, not the first chapter, this Auguste Comte, Comte, I don't know, chapter, Comte. that um, uh, by going back in time from the contemporary notions, you could actually provide a caricature of these notions, which would not be so obvious if you do the chronological progression. And actually what is important in this transition from um, so pathological anatomy to pathological physiology is that it wasn't a chronological step because this Mornani that he mentions as the, the pinnacle of, of systematized uh, pathological ana anatomy uh, lived afterward after Harvey. Uh -huh. So even here, I, I think I, I checked, I can check it now, but there's uh -huh. defi definitely this uh, kind of inconsistency here, which probably should also uh, plays into what you said. Uh, okay, okay. Interesting point. Any other questions? <laughs> if not, Primoz, maybe you can bring something up and then maybe somebody else decides to join still. Well, one thing which I which kind of caught my attention as well is when he's talking about the mutual the influence of literature or art on medicine. And I think that kind of relates to, to the method, methodological problems we were talking about when we're sort of trying to, like this entire interdisciplinarity project is trying to achieve a kind of transcendence. I think we're trying to transcend the methods we have and then to try to find something sort of cohesive, or at least that's one understanding, I think, of this approach. Um, but I, I think a more, a, a much more fertile understanding, a much more humble understanding is just of trying to see it as a kind of cross fertilization. Like you bring a bunch of people together from different directions and they all give so, sort of their, their ideas with using their approaches rather than, rather than trying to, I don't know, uh, adopt the approaches of the, other, uh, of the other people in this group. And that's the way basically how pro progress, I think, and how breakthroughs throughs would happen rather than trying to I don't know, teach scientists to conceptualize and teach philosophers to, to do empirical studies. Um, and um, I think the, the literature part is interesting because art is kind of sly in the way uh, certain viewpoints or ideas can be integrated in a certain artwork and in in what's going on in the views of the characters in some kind of work of literature. And people aren't uh, on the defensive when they're reading. For example, I don't know, reading Dostoevsky, you kind of adopt certain uh, viewpoints, you're more open to them. And uh, consequently, like uh, Kongiem says, like a doctor might be more receptive to certain ideas, to changing his own ideas when he's faced with them in this more, uh, I don't know, hidden, uh, hidden form, like in, a, in an artwork. Um, and I think there's something to be learned learn from this, like the, the entire way we approach interdisciplinarity, the way we try to 
convince the, the other side to sort of, oh yeah, there's a methodological fallacy. M maybe that that's not the right approach. Maybe, maybe it's just leading us into, into more and more crisis and have no, nobody's sure about what you're doing anymore rather than really uh, contributing to, in, in some kind of meaningful way to, to a way forward. I don't know if ever, have anyone else found this uh, part about the literature and art interesting. Yeah, I haven't really paid much. I have to admit that this is the one that I haven't really paid that much attention. It's interesting what you kind of get got out of it, for sure. I completely agree with Primoz. I, I thought almost the same thing as you did. Just... Uh, Can you just, elaborate, Mattia? No, I think I can't. I mean, I, I don't think I need to. I mean, I just wanted to say because I guess... Uh, Okay, so how well, do you, I guess we're the only one. See. But how do you guys envision this then? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not. It's like it's too. I guess it's too idealistic. I think I just not long ago I read something uh, from Rorty, and Rorty I think con conceptualizes this uh, dichotomy between the philosophy and the sciences in the same naive way i think but maybe the this naive notion of uh, collaboration is something we really need because in a sense this methodological approach seems i don't know uh, maybe yes i i think it, it's it's mm, because uh if Maybe I think it's the same. It's the same. The point he's, the Rorty is trying to make is uh, we just need to collaborate. That's the whole point because uh, the the sciences are 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 excluding everything else from the conversation about um, things that um, how would you say uh, that are. Um, a, something everyone needs to, uh, I don't know, think about, but not in the same methodological sense um, on a higher chair or, or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yes, that's why I, I think we agree with pretty much here. Um, but I think this is really a naive position, but again, I think it's, uh, it's appropriate that we adopt such a position because um, I don't know. Uh, it's it seems too radicalized in in this uh, scientific way. I, I think so. So the position that kind of that we that science and philosophy, for instance, should should cooperate and that should find a way to to communicate somehow. Yes, exactly. Because I don't think everything is just. Uh, uh, it's, uh, as straightforward as, as science would like it to be. Mm -hmm. Just for example, I think also, uh, but this is like maybe a, a different thing, but really the new approach to um, ino inoculation, the uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's something we should be um, careful about. I, I think I. I'm going to be inoculated, but uh, in, yes, sh shortly. But um, I was really skeptical about this new approach to um, inoculation because it's it's different. It's something new, and everyone is explaining it like it's something not to be worried about. It's normal, everything, but it's not. It's it's much different from the um, last approach from the. How would you say the the most used till till now approach the the one they which they they inoculated you with the disease yeah and now it, it's something different it's like you make your cells make the disease or something like that and maybe um isaac knows this better I, I i've heard it many times before because um my family uh, goes about uh, on this but um i i can't explain it well so 
Uh, maybe... look, look, Schwarzenegger got inoculated, so it's so it's all good, Matthias. Yes, I guess, <laughs> it's I guess all it... good. Man. I, yeah, I'm not. I, I I'm and, not really scared. He, but... he, apparently, he was very thrilled. He said he was never so thrilled to wait in a row for something than to get this <laughs> shot. So you see, <laughs> and he's a Terminator, Matthias. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. but uh, maybe if. Mm... But I didn't really know about, I mean, I have to be honest, I haven't really paid that much attention. So if anybody can shed some more light on my uh, non-enlightened brain with regards to the new, uh, I, I really don't know about the differences. I have to be honest, I haven't paid that much attention because I knew that when the time comes for me to get inoculated, um, you know, I still have a couple of more months to go till then. <laughs> It's not really pressing for me. <laughs> yeah. So, Mattia, if you can, yes. does anybody know? These Are things? we talking about the, the messenger and arrive vaccinations or? I guess, yeah. I, I guess this, this, this second type we're using now. Um, yeah, yeah, you I have guess to get, a... uh, You have to get vaccinated twice, right? Yeah, but um, I guess that, that was, that, that's, is a separate thing from the new technology because also for like the the meningitis vaccination you had to get vaccinated like three or four times but yeah oh. i guess the, the technology is these are the first vaccinations that are using this new um rni um technology which i i if it's rna i think yeah RNA, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. As I understand it, um, you the, the 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 vaccine makes some of your cells produce the uh, spike protein that is then recognized by the immune system as the uh, the disease, and it builds a response. So when you actually get oh. the, the the virus, which has the spike proteins. The, the immune system recognizes them. Okay. Okay, I get it. So, so you don't, don't actually get the, 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 virus, the virus itself, so. but uh, the uh, RNI that makes your cells produce the protein, which is so not itself dangerous. What are the main concerns um, with regards to all of this? I mean, I, I can imagine I, that... I, Probably people don't really know what this might do. What in the long term or what? Yeah, Probably. maybe like if why if um, I don't know, maybe some other cells will start to produce this or something. But I don't know what really the concerns are. The the technology itself, it's not that old. It's That's not true, that but, new. but maybe the longitudinal issue or question. Yeah, I guess. yeah because there's like no long term studies really. Like this, this is brand new. So that's the concern. But I, I actually I find it interesting so. the, the way the, the public debate has shaped around this, the way the, the media have basically kind of portrayed, like trying questioning this method, uh, this new approach to vaccination is now the same as uh, thinking that vaccinating yourself against measles is going to make you autistic or something. And, and I think it kind of indicates uh, the status uh, science has currently. <laughs> In the in, in the in the current discourse and how much support it has institutionally and among even even among people like it, this is being hailed as a, a huge achievement of science which we should not question so yeah <laughs> i question that two things here one i keep wondering whether nurses could somehow help with all of this <laughs> and the second <laughs> And the second is what you just said, Primoz, kind of reminded me of uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> this issue with regards to uh, evolution. You know, whenever you, have, whenever you have like a debate with regards to the theory of evolution, you always get this idea that the only opposing view is creationism. It's like yeah, yeah. you either buy, you either buy <laughs> Darwinian evolution, or you're a creationist, and and here Dauxonian, are the Dawsonian, uh -huh. uh -huh, Okay, Dawsonian, yeah, Dawsonian, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> True, true. 
No, but th this is also a similar problem. Like there's no nuance with regards to these debates sometimes, or they very quickly uh, get translated into these uh, dichotomies that have become popular in, in a certain, let's say social media space or whatnot. And this is precisely it, you know, whenever, whenever there's like an issue with, um, for example, the theory of evolution, normally what's thrown back at you is you're either a creationist or what 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 would you like would you like to defend a uh, um, um, creationist position or what have you so there's very little nuance with regards to these things except in very specific contexts and very specific milieus and even there uh from my experience debates get heated very quickly and the mm -hmm. perspective is lost. So again, some people who are fervently, fervent believers in evolution and have, I don't know, be become passionate about this because they've read about these dreaded creationists who are, mind you, silly. I'm not being implicit uh, uh, advocate of creationism, uh, uh, just so that we are on, in the clear. Uh, and they, they became very passionate about this. They, they, they react very strongly and very... Uh, enthusiastically to, to any questions uh, that might be raised with regards to this. So you're saying you're a creationist. <laughs> yeah, precisely. That's, uh, that's what I was saying. I'm not an implicit one. I'm an explicit one, basically. <laughs> yeah, but I guess this is sort of what how this topic started. What I'm trying to say is that there's a certain close-mindedness and I think it's both in, in science and in philosophy, because like throughout the most of my studies who are mostly surrounded by humanity students and teachers and philosophy students, there's a certain closeness to the world mm -hmm. of science. And uh, I, I think uh, it's equally problematic and irritating. And this is basically what um, the thing is that I think both fields are sort of trying to present their position as the transcendent one which is going to sort of bind everything together um and th the problem is that we're just we're trying to break through these uh, icebergs when and because it's really it's, it's like a kind of dead dead end alley that is just constantly to think about methodology so what are we doing wrong let's go back to the basic concepts and everything but uh, it might be a dead end it might just be a, a lot of um, conceptual uh, filigrantism but in the end, maybe it will be a more fruitful approach to just take this, uh, like Matthias said, this kind of naive view of things, like just hang together with our different incompatible ideas. And <laughs> to go back to Hegel, some kind of synthesis happens in this, uh, in this mess, L like you described, actually, like it's just messy with, with the things the cognitive science students do. It's just a big mess that, that might not really amount to something in the long term, but uh, it actually might in, in, in a kind of roundabout way. And uh, yeah, th th that's what Kangia made me think about it with this notion of literature and art as a kind of uh, gr a ground where this process can happen w when people let down their guards and some sort of open themselves to, to, a, diff to, to a variety. Of okay, but I have a very concrete question now both for yourself and victoria given the fact that you two are from the field of cognitive science my experience with the students of cognitive science was the following so you were basically thrown together from different fields and different backgrounds and then you were introduced to these different topics you were kind of introduced to philosophy you were introduced to computer science neurology first person research what have you okay a lot of different stuff and you guys you people you you, you were hanging out together <laughs> you were going out for drinks and hanging out together basically but what i've learned is that towards the end of your studies what happened was people gravitated towards a certain field and usually when they would talk about certain other st students they would be like yeah yeah you know they're more they're they're more into Pirtoshek and neuroscience stuff and yeah they're, they're more computer stuff and then you have the neuroscientist guys who, who really dislike the first person stuff and they're like yeah the, the weird the first person whatever stuff uh and i haven't really seen that hanging out together and you know sharing like having beers together and sharing jokes and even sharing curriculum cu curriculum together and having these different subjects that 
eventually it did manage to bridge some of these things because eventually you kind of you know when you shake something and then you have pebbles of the, of similar color ending up together this is the impression i got with your study you kind of shake it and shake it and still and this is martin will probably know more about this it's, it's some sort of a law of distribution i forgot what it is when you you don't really get um an equally distributed pile of white and dark gravel but they trend they tend to kind of yeah, they coalesce the they coalesce kind of somehow things. they kind of yeah they, they 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 form these chunks uh this is the impression i got so i don't know what your view or experience was with regards to that i mean in regards to the slovene experience i would completely agree i i i didn't have this experience of openness and uh, like cr this cross fertilization here i think everyone was very much set in their ways and sort of resisted everything to the contrary and pretty much remained that way but uh i think like in vienna they actually do this a lot better because <laughs> we had um, we had this class and in, in trying to interpret fmri studies and pretty much all of these studies de develop into some kind of philosophical uh, examination of the basic ideas being explored and i felt like the students there were much more open to this and um i think it, it, it might be I think philosophy might be to in, in a certain degree lacking in the Slovene execution of, of the entire thing. There's a certain certain aspect of philosophy which is being dealt with, but I don't think it's wide enough to really uh, introduce people to what philosophy is all about. It's like it's it's being presented as this, this scalpel of uh, a conceptual analysis, and that's all it is. And I don't think that's enough to really sway people into the way of philosophy. I think you have much more like just reading a Socratic dialogue rather than uh, uh, learning about the, the, the various conceptual names for all the ways you can look at the, at the mind. And I think that's a big problem, the way it's being done here. Yeah, but I, I just want to point out here that like philosophy is not the main thing that should bind together cognitive science students. Philosophy is just one pebble, like one aspect of the whole scheme but, but yeah like going back to your question sebastian like in my experience um our generation let's say was quite open-minded about all of the different fields that contribute to the cognitive science and then as the years progressed like we all drifted towards our interests a lot more i mean we still hung out like i for example was more into the first person experiences but we hung out with uh, the high end like uh, neuroscience junkies let's say and it was it was okay i mean we respected each other's differences and our views and we will we were able to have a very deep and good discussion about all of these things and then just, I mean, as the years progressed, we all had like different uh, curriculums, different courses that we took. We went to different universities. And so we, in a way, drifted apart in that way. But um, yeah, is there any like a specific question that you have regarding no, no, no. this? This was just, you know, for example, when I was uh, dealing with uh, some of the students who decided to say, do a master's with me or when I would be out for them and I would just we would just we would just talk about the the, the whole experience about the, 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 the so the study experience and also when I would deliver uh, there's this lecture where you have this um, Maya Bresianac has a, a, some sort of a course and then you're invited as a as a say as a philosopher to <laughs> to, to basically explain to the students of cognitive science about the methods that we philosophers use when we're pursuing philosophical questions. So I was asked to do that, to elaborate on philosophical methodology. And usually this ended up with my going for a cup of tea with the students and basically discussing these things. And uh, what I've noticed from these exchanges is usually there was... Um, People were, like you said, they were um, 
and but it was a, a somewhat different tone to the whole thing so they were basically one might say friends or good acquaintance acquaintances or maybe just sometimes you know colleagues that have to hang out but usually they would hang out some of them they would enjoy each other's company some of them less so but what i've realized is when you get to the topic of what is of interest to them and how this relates to certain other people they would usually have this it wasn't really putting down the other side, but it was more like, yeah, you know, those hard-nosed neuroscience. It was usually, you know, it wasn't like, yeah, you know, we we have different different perspectives, but we study the phenomena of cognition. It was more like, you know, okay, I get it. it they find it interesting, but ultimately they're kind of either naive or or flaky if you know if, if if someone who is more prone or more keen on neuroscience would say something like yeah these fluffy first person whatever yeah you know it's just it's not really proper cognitive <laughs> science and then someone from first first person would say they they have they have no feel for the you know for the philosophical dimension or for the experiential dimension what have you so my experience was that this shaking basically did result in people ending up in different cultures eventually. So it didn't really produce a cognitive scientist. It produced either a first person researcher or someone who is very into uh, computer science or someone who is very into uh, a neuroscience. There was no cognitive science, scientist, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I agree with that. Like there is a big effort to integrate all of these parts into one cohesive whole. Mm -hmm. and also for people to be able to hold all of these different perspectives and views on like different fields as views on one phenomenon <coughs> say. um i think that cognitive science in itself is struggling with that also mm -hmm. currently yeah so that would be uh, the, the reason why i brought this up initially is because this kind of directly affects what Primoz and Matteo were saying, you know, maybe we need to forego the methodological epistemological reflections and simply just, you know, hang out, do stuff together. I don't think it's necessarily something that would end up, you know, producing <laughs> results. So that, that's the reason why I asked you, um, you, you, you said that you were kind of, you found the literature and art interesting but I don't really know how this might bring about the connection. Hmm. Are they supposed to jam together? I, I think, <laughs> you know, maybe this is kind of biased from my viewpoint, but I, th I think a, one of the problem is actually that philosophy is just one of the pebbles in the, in the mosaic of cognitive science. And, and I think the, the problem is that it basically paints philosophy as this assortment of theories about the mind. And that's, mm -hmm. that's basically what philosophy is. And I think that's a very narrow and actually kind of completely misconstrued view of philosophy, at least if you look at the entire history of philosophy, which has been all kinds of weird things. And um, I, I think, okay, that's, that's philo it's basically philosophy of mind. And which is fine, because I guess it sort of helps you to clarify the concepts, uh, yada, yada, and everything. But um, the glue, which I see also in art, art is basically the, the battlefield where we kind of let us, let our, open ourselves to the, to the enemy. But if we kind of want to do this in a more serious scientific way, is by trying to introduce philosophy, not as a field of theories, but as an approach to reality which which is a kind of at least in my idealistic view a kind of open uh, op a kind of open approach to, to reality like and um, i think this could be the glue which would hold which would hold the different parts together not not in philosophy as this okay uh, this guy's theory of mind or this guy's theory of mind but a, a, as a kind of yeah r relationship to reality relationship to yourself uh, a way, a way of living, uh, which I, I know is very platonistically I, idealistic and very Greek fashion. Uh, but I think, in general, like in the degree, I, I found that aspect completely missing, and um, I, I found it frustrating how people actually start to dislike philosophy 
for being this uh, like just nitpicking at, at concepts constantly like it, that's that's all it's about and uh, when we are discussing maybe at like at a beer in Vienna, uh, that's the best times we actually had doing philosophy, just discussing things in this very open, naive fashion. And that's where I think I, I, had, some, I had some friends who actually started as these uh, hard set materialists. And then we just pissed each other off, just messing around. And then there's this sort of open and stop. OK, shit, you actually showed them this might not be the, the way. And I think that's much more productive than just Ex cathedra, uh, pontificating on the various theories of the philosophy of mind, but yeah, that's cultivation of wonder, huh, Primoz? Yeah, <laughs> I, I'd really like to add something because it's 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 the same. It's like reading Rorty. It's really it's listening to. It's like reading Rorty. I don't know how to say this differently, but it's, I mean, he also talks exactly about the problem of philosophy and philosophers um, as um, it's, it's, we must, uh, how we say, we must, we must uh, uh, let go of no, a notion of philosopher that has emerged, um, I think, especially in the modern times, as someone who knows something, as a philosopher, um, as a philosophy as, prof as a profession. Rorty criticizes this philosophy as a profession because it does exactly what uh, so the sciences do, in his opinion, because the sciences or the systematic philosophy also, um, but the natu naturalist and I, I guess the sciences will do. Uh, the sciences are the, the problem because they normalize the discourse and the, this normalization of the discourse manifests itself, uh, he says, in a fear of, uh, of science and scientism or naturalism and, and so on. Uh, and to, to bridge this gap, we need to uh, forget about the philosophy as um, something which can be a profession or a philosopher is someone who knows something. And I, I completely agree with Primoz in this sense that in art, we, we let go of um, these um, pre presuppositions of something that we know something. And that's exactly what Rorty is trying to say. This normalized discourse of science is something like something imposed on everything. And then if you try to talk about uh, something unnatural, he says, I think a natural something, it doesn't matter, but uh, something unnatural, uh, you try to invade almost the natural discourse with something unnatural, it is like an invasion because the natural discourse, the scientific discourse that is imposed on everything, so, uh, or so it seems, just um, it blocks out every possible um, unsci unscientific explanation of things. And when a philosopher takes the position of someone that, uh, of someone who knows something, then it's like two opposing forces and something that is, I mean, that's exactly the, um, also the, the, no, I'm not going into this now. But uh, yes, that's what I'm trying to say. I think I, I totally agree with Primoz. And we, we need to, and we need philosophy as someone, uh, as something that it's not um, certain about things. And we need, uh, he says, we need to advocate the, because he also, I mean, think this is more, this will clarify things because I'm bad at explaining, but, uh, he substitutes the um, truth for hope, Rorty. And this is exactly the most naive position you can have, I think, to substitute truth for hope. And this hope is for hope for discourse. To, uh, so we must advocate the, the fact of uh, the possibility of unusual or not normal conversations, which, um, which I don't know, uh, 
a mine um, or how would you say uh, destroyed the, the hope uh, we have in the knowledge acquired by by scientific um, methods and science in general. Um, so this this self-assurance that science um, is going with towards everything and all knowledge, it's, some, it's something we, we must oppose or something we must uh, be uh, skeptical about, this self-assurance of its uh, techniques of its knowledge. Um, and I, I think this is it now. Yeah. And, and this is also why I think dialogue, like I've been, I keep repeating this thing, like chiasmus and everything, the, the, the dial, dialogical part of philosophy, I think is tragically neglected. And I think that that's an important part. And like, just going back to cognitive science, the philosophy, the way philosophy is done there is not, is at least the, when it's presented as philosophy, maybe in some of the other courses, it actually is done more in a more kind of di dialogue. But in general, I, the, um, the dialogue is missing uh, in in philosophy in general. And if you look at the way uh, academic philosophy is being done, it's basically a host of papers, a host of positions being produced in certain uh, tracts, and uh, there's no real um, no real mixing, e even within philosophy. Let alone philosophy co uh, co cooperating or cross fertilizing with something as different as science in the empirical sense. Okay, I, I would suggest that given the fact that it's already half past eight, that maybe we call it a quit today. We've uh, uh, drifted a little bit away from the topic, but in an interesting way, I, I, I assume, and uh, especially given the context in which this happened. So we ended up on the note of a uh, dialogue being important. And here we are having a dialogue over a Zoom in a virtual setting enabled by who else then? scientists <laughs> uh, so uh, the next session is next week I think that uh, Barbara will have the presentation uh, Barbara you can still have it in Slovene if you like uh, we'll have just have the discussion in English uh, as now um, no, I already prepared it in English, so no worries. Yeah, you already prepared it? No, yeah, I mean, I started it in Slovene and then you sent the team and I was like, no. So then I started again and yeah. And there you are. It will be in English. Okay, I think it's a good practice in general. So uh, I'll be seeing you next Thursday, six o'clock again. Have a great night, evening. See ya. Bye-bye.